Okay. So tonight uh, we begin uh, as usual with the um, happiness for learning mini workshop and I will focus on exercise towards happiness. We will devote as usual 10 minutes to this particular session and after that we will devote another 10 minutes to a drop-in session where you can ask questions about the assessments, questions about the topics that we've covered in administrative law. And then we proceed with our regular tutorial at seven o'clock uh, Queensland time. We are of course prepared to extend beyond 8 p.m. Uh, for the purpose of answering any other questions you might have or for another drop-in session. So, and I also wish to thank uh, those of you who are here uh, have decided to join tonight's session. So thanks. So uh, I should probably begin by already, right? Unless there's uh, any anything you'd like to take up, comments, questions before I proceed. None. So we're all good. Now remember, there is going to be a session, a drop-in session after this, where you could ask your question. But in the meantime, um, you know, allow me to talk about exercise towards happiness. So. After this session, you will critically reflect on the impact of exercise and happiness and how to get into the habit of exercising. And I think this is a relevant topic, especially as I said, because it's the start of the new year. And we often end up with a lot of New Year's resolutions. A lot of us would probably have considered joining a gym, um, buying some kind of a weight equipment, deciding on running, swimming, or doing you know, all sorts of sports activities. But as we all know, it's one thing to make decisions or resolutions or set goals, and it's altogether a different thing to start doing them. So there's a huge disconnect uh, in the human person between what they know is correct and what they should be doing as opposed to behavior. So for instance, um, a lot of people know that smoking is bad. A lot of people perhaps know that you know drinking too much is bad, uh, taking drugs is bad, and yet, we know that a lot of people engage in it anyway. Now, we're not trying to be judgmental, we're just trying to, to, to uh, emphasize that there is sometimes, there's often a disconnect between what we know is good for us and what is bad, and yet we tend to do certain things that we know is harmful to us. And part of that might be in, you know, in relation to being students, is that we know that we need to study, study a lot, but sometimes, some, sometimes we don't. So that, that's just for emphasis. Now, so the topic is going to be on exercising because studies show that, uh, you know, if a person exercises, it releases endorphins. And endorphins are chemicals that are naturally produced in the body that produce a, a high, a, you know, a, an experience which makes you happy. And um, it might be said that... Um, for some people who want a quick fix, they turn to, I don't know, food, to have the endorphins, some turn to drugs, you know, just to get that high, that feeling of high. But in fact, exercise has been proven and has been shown to trigger the release of endorphins uh, in the body, and endorphins are the feel-good chemicals in the body. Now, let me begin by telling you something about myself. So uh, this picture was taken uh, in 2010 when I went to the U.S. to visit my brothers. So if you notice, I was a bit overweight. Not that I'm no longer overweight, but I was, you know, much, much more overweight about eight years ago. I was probably about 105 kg. Uh, the, the, the heaviest I was was at about 108 kg. And... At, at the time, I was a bit younger then, you know, a few years, and I felt, you know, um, I should probably be able to eat as much as I want. And, you know, when the point comes when I feel a bit older, then I will exercise. That's when I start thinking about my health. And then, you know, my, my daughter was born uh, in 2011. So I have a six-year-old daughter. And then it made me, and then, you know, all sorts of um, health issues arose, including gout, uh, high sugar blood sugar levels, uh, what, uh, problems with cholesterol, etc., which some of you who might be my age would probably encounter when you do have a blood test. And I figured, you know, if I wanted to live longer, I needed to do something about my health, and especially because I had young kids. 
And so what I've done is actually, um, you know, I actually started really seriously exercising only last year. And I am happy to say that since then, this is how my body looks like. Actually, that's not true. That's not me. I'm just kidding. So I'm still overweight, okay? But my, my, my body weight has dropped tremendously. Um, so from 108, it went down to 98 last year. December, it's now down to 90 kg. My goal was to make it drop to 85. Wasn't successful, but I'm happy where I'm at. And, well, I need to, I, I need to uh, tell you in advance that research tells us that actually losing weight is never easy, okay? So for those of you who are struggling with weight, trying to lose weight, um, studies show that losing weight is never easy because, according to studies, there is such a thing as a set point in our body. So when our body notices that we're, we're you know, we're, we're, that we're, we're beginning to lose weight, the evolutionary mechanisms of feast and famine kicks in so that our metabolism actually slows down. And that's the reason why people who are actually on a diet may lose weight initially, but actually they regain their weight in a few years. So if you have been watching, um, if you have been watching uh, the Biggest Loser shows and so on, in about 95 of the cases of all the individuals who participated, perhaps about 98% of them, they all regained their weight in a few years, usually about three to five years. And in fact, they became heavier. So, you know, it's a perplexing problem. Martin Seligman, who is the founder of um, Positive Psychology and was at one time in 1990, was the president of the American Psychological Association, has admitted that, you know, because he is such a brilliant guy, he studies um, positive psychology, and it, he has admitted it is not easy for him to lose weight. So I know how difficult it is, but there are some strategies. And as I said, um, an example perhaps is that today I'm actually a bit tired because for the very first time in my life, I ran for eight kilometers today. I've never done it. When I was younger, when I was perhaps in my, you know, when I was 16 or 17, I, I even had trouble running for one kilometer. And, but the only time, the first time that I was able to run for one kilometer was actually last year. And it was a struggle, but since then, you know, 5K has been okay. And just today, I did eight kilometers. So the question is, how do you do it? Now, there are a lot of studies that show, that one, you know, you begin by taking small bites, taking small steps. It has, it's not about the willpower alone, because willpower, there's such a thing as uh, ego depletion, according to the study by uh, Burmeister. You, I don't know if you've heard of the uh, marshmallow test. And what it suggests is that if you constantly use your willpower, such as you know, trying to force yourself not to eat a cookie that's just right there, or trying to not buy something when you go to a store, it actually depletes your willpower. It calls it ego depletion. And so therefore, if you use your willpower for the purpose of you know, pushing yourself to exercise, it, it is a difficult battle to win. And a lot of uh, people, such as, for example, a book written by um, Cialdani, uh, Robert Cialdani, a book on influence, he says that it's, it shouldn't be about relying on willpower alone, but relying on the environment and putting the proper cues. So for some of them, what they've done is actually, you know, if, if their intention is actually to run, they would already set their, you know, they would put their shoes right next to their bed so that the first thing that they see when they wake up would be the running shoes. And then they tell themselves, you know, just put on these shoes, you know, wear shorts, put on these shoes, and see what happens next. But those small cues actually then lead to the, to the desired behavior, and that's when you start running. And so, for example, when I ran today, because I was, I was very tired when I decided to go running today, I said I was just going to run for five kilometers, not, not five kilometers, for just five minutes. And then when I hit the five-minute mark, I say, okay, I think I can do another five minutes. And I kept on doing that, you know, for every five minutes until I finished it in 65 minutes. So it's 6.50. And so my, my challenge to you, given the, given the evidence that exercise uh, is really, you know, good for us, is to consider exercise. Now, I, I am aware that for those who are married, for those who are partners, having a partner has the benefit that, you know, you can, 
with your partner, you can release endorphins through natural activities with your partner, right? And uh, I don't know what you're thinking about, but I'm talking about you know going to the movies or eating in a fancy restaurant. So I don't know what some of you are thinking. But for some of us who are single, like myself, I, I, I've not been married. I mean, I, I divorced my wife about two and a half years ago. I'm alone. So there are certain things which couples can do, but I can't. So, um, I mean, I know that there are some who say that, you know, there are certain things that you can do by yourself that will make you happy. And that might be true, including, to me, gardening, playing golf. Some of you may have other thoughts about, um, yeah, I, I love getting to that. So, but, you know, the easy way is just to exercise. Okay, so um, that's it for me for now. So I've covered uh, the importance of happiness. I mean, the importance of exercise for happiness. Um, exercise has also been shown to actually help people move away from depression, from be, feel, being, being sad. Evidence actually shows that for people who are depressed, exercise is just as effective, perhaps even more effective than antidepressants, perhaps even more effective than cognitive behavioral therapy or talking to a psycho psychiatrist or a psychologist or even a counselor. So think about it. So uh, exercise is good. It's good for the soul. It's good for the body. It makes you, you know, live longer. You don't have to suffer, you know. I mean, I'm still struggling, as I said, but um, it's good for your body. And, um, you know, it, it does wonderful things. So, but the important thing is you don't rely on your willpower alone, but try to do something about your situation, about your environment so that it becomes easier uh, to get into the habit of exercise. So I'll stop there. Now, we have a few minutes for a drop-in session. Any questions? I'll probably begin by talking about, what a segue, right? You know, happiness for learning session, and then we start talking about administrative law. But, you know, that's the way it goes. So, um, I announced today uh, in the email that uh, the final take-home paper will be released on the 10th of February. It is a Saturday at 9 a.m. in the morning, Queensland time, and you will have 24 hours to finish it on a Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning, Queensland time as well. Would you have any questions, concerns at this drop-in session before we start talking about natural justice at 7? Comments, questions, whatever. No comments or questions? We're good. Okay. Sorry. Oh, yes. Major, it's Emma. I have a question. Um, given that we've got 24 hours for the take-home paper, yes. are you going to put up all the answers to all the previous quiz questions? There's a few quiz questions where the answers haven't been provided. Um, mm. my, my only reason for asking is that I found them quite helpful during the constitutional mm. law take-home paper. Um, to help with my, my thinking. Um, mm. So I'm just wondering if that might be made available to all of us. Very good suggestion, Emma. I will do that. So um, Thank you. I'll start working on, the, on some of the answers. I think it provided answers to two of the quizzes I haven't done for the others. So I'll start working on them over the weekend and hopefully by next week, you know, I should be able to provide the, the answers to the remaining quizzes. Thanks for that suggestion. And of course, you must remember that I've always posted the answers to the weekly discussion questions. So again, that is a source of uh, information for you. Now, uh, I, I just wish to emphasize that as far as my answers are concerned, both in the quizzes and in the discussion questions, they're quite abbreviated. They're condensed. Okay? They're just direct to the point. They're not meant or intended to appear like they're answers to final exam or final assessment questions. I would expect a lengthier and more thorough answer uh, in a final assessment question, but the, the answers I give are just meant to go direct to the point as to what the answer is. In fact, uh, in, in, uh, in most cases, I don't even identify the issue. So that, that's just a warning. I just wanted to, you know, to tell you that and emphasize that the answers and quizzes that I provide and the answers to the discussion questions are directed to the point, but you're expected in a final assessment uh, question to provide a more thorough answer following the IRAC format. 
questions, comments? Hi, Mengyo. Uh, yes. With the final assessment, mm -hmm. um, do we still need to reference and do footnotes or the previous um, message that you sent still stand? Yep, so there, there is no need for any footnote. There is no need for any bibliography either. But uh, if you could, it would be helpful if you're able to cite in the paper in what is known as index referencing the case. So simple as saying, you know, um, Kiowa versus West, 1985, blah, blah, blah. That's enough. You don't have to make it a footnote. It'll be helpful if you're able to do that. So, oh, okay. So hmm. just in text, um, in text, the references? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's so good. Thanks. You'll see the way I do it, right? In the, in the discussion answers that I give. Yeah. Uh, in the word file, I have the in-text referencing there. And yes. actually, that's the way it's done in the textbook. They don't use footnotes. Okay. Let's try yeah, that's good. We're just, we're just going to go with that. Um, I, I would imagine that a full citation is better. It shouldn't be too difficult anyway to pick up the full citation. You know, it's just a matter of what. It's just a few tech, It's just a few characters you'll have to use. So try to go for the full citation. It shouldn't be that difficult anyway, especially because um, when we go to week 12, when we have the revision tutorial, I will be flagging to you the, the topics that will be covered in the final examination. And so, you know, you, you, you would already be prepared uh, and have uh, proper notice as to what the most likely questions will be and what possible cases you are likely going to be citing. So it shouldn't be too difficult for you to just, you know, come up with a full text, uh, the full citation of any, of any case. Now, I've got a question from Jess. How many students failed this subject last term? Good question. Oh, I, I don't think, I don't think uh, I flunked uh, that, that many. Um, let's, just, let's, let's just say that I became, um, I became a more compassionate teacher. Uh, in the sense that there was a time where, uh, and I don't want to be, I don't want to be, be uh, misportrayed here, but there was a time when um, I felt that my job was as a gatekeeper, so that you know, I would think that if a student is not doing too well, that student should fail because that student should that student that student shouldn't enter the legal profession. But then I realized that you know, when I was a student, I I did struggle myself. And um, I then realized that, you know, students have their own challenges and there was no reason for me to be overly judgmental about students. And so I had a kind of a change of heart so that now I tend to be a bit more caring. I don't know if it's showing. I tend to be more compassionate in the sense that where before, when I couldn't understand what the student is saying and say, my God, what is the student doing? I then say, okay, I'm sure the student is trying to tell me something. What is it? Ah, okay, I think this is what the student is saying. And then, uh, oftentimes, I you know, provide marks uh, for what I believe the student is trying to say. And for that reason, um, fewer students actually failed. Um, the, I would think that... Uh, the, the students that failed were actually the ones who did not take the final assessment. Had they actually, you know, taken the trouble of submitting the final take-home paper, they would have passed. But because they did not, they failed. So um, it, for, for some of you, I mean, for as long as you study, I'm not saying that, you know, you're definitely going to pass. But I would assume that if you study and I could see that the effort is there, I don't see any reason why a student will fail. Okay, now I have a question from Mira here. Is, is that the, the way you pronounce it, or is it Myra? Does the exam cover all the topics? Definitely not, so it will be easier. Um, there will only be four or five topics at the most that will be covered in the final take-home paper, and I will tell you what those will be. So you can actually focus on them. Uh, is it harder three-hour exam? I, I would think that the online take-home paper is actually much easier to do than an Invigilated exam. No, am I shaking your head? I mean, that, that's my thing. Yes? I disagree. Why is that? Take home papers are much harder. Well, why is that? 
Well, there seems to be more expectation on the students in a take-home paper. You have a certain amount of time uh, and there's a higher expectation of the students to do quite well, whereas in a uh, integrated exam um, scenario, okay, okay. There, there's not that kind of pressure. I see what you mean. Um, I, can, I can honestly tell you that it will not matter to me. Can I um, just add to Emma's comment, Manjo? Yes, well? Louis, yes. Um, I just think with take-home papers, it gives you the opportunity to overthink it. Like, um, I know I sit there going, holy crap, and then I, I, mm. I tend to overthink it, which is probably where most of my, my time goes. Uh, um, whereas I think in an individuated exam, you yeah. know you're on the clock, so you just got to go with your gut and once you've read the question and you go, oh, right. yeah. I think, um, yeah, right. I think, personally, I think that's why I take home maybe yeah. for me. I think you're both right, Emma and Louise, that um, some do find, you know, the, the online take on paper to be a bit more challenging because of the expectation. But on the other hand, um, not, not, it's not so much about, you know, the, the, the difficulty or not of the final take on paper. For some, it's actually the ease in taking the assessment. They, they'd rather, you know, do it online rather than go to a testing center in a, in a condition where somebody's watching them. At any rate, that will become multi academic beginning in 2018 because the law discipline has def will definitely shift to the invigilated exam mode starting in term one 2018 in relation to the priestly 11 subjects, uh, I mean units. So for certain, starting in term one 2018, all the priestly 11 um, units will be invigilated exams. And what we need to remember is that this isn't a question of simply an initiative coming from the law discipline. This is a result of pressure coming from the AP, LAP, LAPB, the Law Admissions Practitioners Board, as well as the Association of Law Deans in Australia. So it, that pressure is coming from them and we have to comply in relation at least to the priest 11 subject. Okay, now it's seven o'clock. Yes. Just before we finish, hmm. um, with this exam being just 24 hours, yes. is some account going to be taken if anybody has other commitments on that particular day, such as work or family commitments, and they can't sorry, get sorry, it done that, in that 24 uh, hours? You, you're, you're cutting out. Can, can you just repeat that for me, please? With the exam just being 24 hours, mm -hmm. Is any consideration going to be taken of anybody who has work commitments on that day or, you know, other commitments that they can't get out of? No. Well, Unfortunately not. That's where it's not really fair. I know. So, yeah. It's, you know, put some people, a lot of people in this course have got kids who are home at the yeah. weekend. Um, they've got work commitments as well. It's a bit hard on them. I, I know, I understand that. When I say uh, it's, it's a no, it's not because I, I want it to be a no. I don't have the authority to approve that. It can only be approved by the Deputy Dean for Teaching and Learning. So in relation to the final take-home papers, the unit coordinator does not have the authority or the power to actually approve any extension. It can only be approved by the Deputy Dean for Teaching and Learning, as well as the uh, Learning and Teaching Services. Only they decide. Uh, it's really beyond my control. So I understand. The, yes, Peter? Our other exams that we've had as take-home papers, they've given 48 hours for us. Yeah. And that's been fair enough. Mm. The, the, the thing is, um, again, it's not my decision to make it 24 hours. It is a decision that was initiated by Professor Stephen Colbrand. We had a meeting on this in term two of 2017. There has been a policy decision to make it 24 hours. I consulted Stephen yesterday. I consulted with him again today. And the decision is it has to be 24 hours. So it's really beyond my hands. I mean... There, there, there is only so much that a unit coordinator can do. I mean, I wish I could make it 48 hours, but it's not within my power. Okay, now we will have time to um, discuss these you know, concerns later on, okay? 
uh, after the tutorial, but since it's now 7.06 uh, in, my, in my clock, I'd rather now go to the weekly tutorial. And then um, with, the, with the notice that after the tutorial, I will hold a drop-in session where we could again, you know, take up any other concerns or questions that you might have. From Louise, you're right. Um, in the environmental exam, and I think corporation law, and one other one that is given, that is given by John Milburn for the four take-home papers that he has, or three rather, three. Um, the the take-home papers are only uh, available for four hours. They need to be done in four hours. Okay. Oh, from Kathleen, did I have my oral tonight? Um, Kathleen, if you're ready, we you will have your oral tonight after the um, tonight's tutorial. Okay. So okay, let's begin. So tonight we're going to be talking about natural justice. Natural justice uh, as a concept is very important, not only because it is a ground for judicial review under the ADJR Act. But as far back as the 1800s, the common law has recognized that a breach of natural justice is a ground for the courts to intervene. It is a ground for judicial review. And in fact, natural justice is uh, the, number, the first ground you will notice in the ADJR Act as a ground for judicial review, mainly because, um, as it often, often happens, it is often easy to make out a situation where a person's right to natural justice has been breached. The question, however, is what exactly is natural justice? And when you see that there is a breach of natural justice, what exactly is the content of natural justice? What does it mean? And that's what we will try to pin down tonight. So tonight, after studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the principle of natural justice and when it applies, the hearing rule, as well as the rule against bias. So we will have um, four discussion questions to take up. The fourth uh, and final uh, discussion question is quite related to the quiz six. Is it quiz six? To the quiz that we have, that we're running right now. And so if you listen well to the discussion for quiz four, you will have a sense as to how to answer properly. Uh, the current ongoing quiz. Okay, so having said that, can I have someone volunteer to read problem one for us? Can I have somebody volunteer? I'll go with Najo. Leone, yes, Leone, thank you. Go ahead, Leone. The Business Regulations and Control Act Commonwealth requires that before a person or persons may engage in business or a commercial activity, prior registration must be secured from the Australian Business Regulatory Agency. The Act provides that the agency has the power to shut down a busy or commercial activity that operates without being registered with it. In addition, the agency may also seize documents, papers, goods, properties and assets belonging to an unregistered business and impose a fine. The Act is silent on whether prior notice must be given by the agency before seizing the documents, papers, goods, properties and assets belonging to an unregistered business. Aaron Lamb had been operating a small business for some time by selling his handmade goods to customers online. However, he failed to register with the Australian Business Regulatory Agency. In February, representatives of the Australian Business Regulatory Agency came to his house without notice and seized his goods, documents and papers. They informed Lamb that his goods, document and papers would only be returned after he paid a fine of $10,000. Lamb has come to you as a solicitor for advice. Advise Lamb on the validity or invalidity of the actions of the agency. Thank you, Leonie. So let's uh, give it a few seconds to digest the problem. And, you know, when somebody is ready, perhaps um, you could volunteer to try to provide an advice to Lamb.
Any volunteers? Um, Manja, it's Mira. Mira, yes. I just put up a really lengthy attempt at an answer to this in the mm -hmm. discussion questions, but um, it was quite long. I was kind of trying to go through the issues, that, you know, doing the hierarchy thing. Um, I guess at the end of it, to sort of get to the point, is that the thing that was questionable to me was that it's a minister. Sorry, Samantha, that's not it. Um, that's the next question. <laughs> um, sorry, so look. Take your time. That's all right. Mira. It is it's so long. Um, the major issue here is prior, prior notice and a fair um, right to be heard rather than bias is the main issue mm -hmm. um, in relation to natural, just, natural justice. Um, would you start off by going, I don't know if I should have gone into as much detail as I did talking about how, you know, the disputed, whether it's just statutory versus common law and the different opinions about that or um is that just in much detail um uh yeah that's sort of the question that i had but i mean yeah i started off by talking about you know no man should be deprived of his mm. and it is like um you know his um property and his um means to make money so mm. it is like a personal interest um mm. Uh, has been in personal right. Um, so it meets that rule. Um, and then there's the rule rationales for exclusion. Mm. So whether or not the um, legislation provided um, outlined clearly um, mm. that it was what the exclusion was mm -hmm. is the rule, um, I think, in, in KR versus West, I mm -hmm. think. Um, and in this case, it says it's silent about that. Mm. Um, so, you know, it could be said that it's not applicable. Anyway, let's mm. I'll start. Very good. I mean, <laughs> that's a good start. So you were, you were, you know, you've identified uh, some key points there, especially about the failure of uh, the agency to give him prior notice. And um, yeah, so that, that is an important point there. So that's uh, actually what I, what I want to say. So the the main point is that no, the question is the other side of it is that you know, like in KO versus West, that it was against the law that what that guy was doing because he'd overstated be his visa, mm. so mm. he was actually already breaking the law. Mm. And the question I had was similarly here. Technically, that guy is breaking the law already. Mm. So if you give him prior notice, it will give him pre warning that. Um, and it will mess up the purpose of the act to actually impose a sanction on people who aren't registered under mm -hmm. the act. So mm -hmm. I don't didn't really have a definitive answer, but that was the two sides of it, I thought. Very good. So you've actually correctly cited the case of Kiowa versus West, which is very relevant to uh, an answer to this question. Thanks for that, Mira. And, you know, I, I will take up your answer in a short while. I just wonder if there might be others who would like to proffer an answer as well to this problem. And then what I will do is to give a short, quick answer, and then I'll give a lengthier answer had it been a question asked in a final assessment. Okay, so I'm gonna do a shortened version and then a lengthier version after, afterwards. Would there be anyone else who'd like to say, you know, say something about the problem? Menjo. Yes, Emma. It's Emma. So the first thing that jumped out at me was that these people, which has got nothing really to do with the admin law, but these people have come to his house without notice. So there's trespass, like there's tortious conduct straight away. So doesn't he have rights um, in that regard? Mm, okay. How, how about the fact that the, the law seems to say that um, the agency may seize documents, papers, goods, properties, and assets belonging to an unregistered business and impose a fine. As it happens here in the, under the facts, Aaron Lamb is doing his business in his house. So, you know, um, the agency has, can't possibly go to an, to an office in a commercial area because the house is the business. And it would appear that the law is allowing that. 
But isn't his business not, uh, well, I suppose it's a business because it's handmade goods, but is it, what, what's the definition, their definition of their commercial activity? Like, does it take in, say, a hobby, that sort of thing, or is that not part of it? Let's probably begin by identifying the legal issue here. What exactly is the legal issue? The legal issue is to, um, is to discretion. The whether 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 the um, whether the department or the or the the actors of the agency mm -hmm. are operating within the um, what's allowable under the statute, or whether they are um, acting discretionally outside of what is allowable under the statute, um, they can't just make things up as they see fit. Mm -hmm. They have to be operating within the limits of the enactment that um, that they exist. Okay, very good. So um, these are two possible issues. Is the decision authorized by the statute? That's the first question. Very good, thank you, Carl. The second possible legal issue is, is the discretion exercised properly? And again, you will notice uh, what, Carl has, what Carl has done in identifying the legal issue is actually looking for, for the grounds uh, to question the validity of the actions of the agency. So as far as identifying the legal issue is, is concerned, what we're trying to do, and as Carla's trying to do, is actually to identify the grounds that would show the invalidity of the actions of the agency. And we will recall in our um, discussion last, not last week, but in the last tutorial we had in December, that uh, one of the grounds for judicial review under the ADGR Act is the question of whether or not the decision is actually authorized by the statute. And there's also the question of whether or not the discretion, if it exists, has been exercised properly. Now, so those are possible legal issues, but because we're talking here about natural justice as the topic, could that be a legal issue here? And if so, why or why not? Do they have the right to um, impound his goods without um, first advising him on giving notice or a hearing of some description. Okay, so we could, thank you, Peter. We could probably say that um, did the actions of the agency constitute a breach of the right to natural justice of, what's his name, of Lamb? Happy with that? Could that be the legal issue as well? So, um, okay, so let's address these points, then, and then I'll go to, uh, to, the, to the right to natural justice. Let's first begin with whether or not the decision is authorized by the statute. So let's discuss that first. And we must remember that the focus of tonight's topic is natural justice. And we need to remember as well that oftentimes when the executive makes a decision or undertakes an action, it is possible that the, that the uh, executive's action may actually breach various rights. It may actually lead to various grounds for judicial review, not just one, but many. And so potentially it could be that the decision is not authorized with the statute, the discretion was not exercised properly, and so on. But in relation to the first legal issue, is the decision authorized by the statute? The decision to seize the documents, is that authorized by the statute? Can I make two points, Manjo? Yes, Emma, go ahead. So, firstly, in the in the instructions, um, it says that uh, the agency can seize documents, papers, goods, properties, and assets, mm. but it doesn't actually. It's not clear and doesn't expressly state that they can actually enter private property. So that's the first point. Ah, okay. The second point is that it says the act is silent on whether prior notice must be given. Mm. Well, my understanding is that it is presumed that natural justice will be afforded unless it's expressly stated in the Act mm -hmm. that um, natural justice or um, procedural fairness is to be excluded. Very good. Okay. Um, we'll get back to that because, you, you know, Emma, well, if you don't mind, I'll get back to the issue about natural justice. Th those are valid points, but I want to proceed first. 
uh, in relation to the question about the decision being authorized by the statute. I make this point because, especially in relation to the final assessment questions, you need to be able to identify the proper legal issue. Because if you end up identifying the wrong legal issue, it's, it, it, it's almost like you know, um, trying to run after a red herring. You may end up discussing to the death a particular legal issue, but if it is the wrong legal issue that you've identified, you still haven't resolved the question. Okay, so for, for that reason, um, I would argue that for this question, the proper legal issue is not whether or not the decision is authorized by the statute. Because if you were to say, even if you were to say, you know, if, if that were the legal issue, the answer is likely to be that the decision is authorized by the statute because the statute says that the agency may seize documents, papers, goods, properties, and assets belonging to an unregistered business. How else is the agency going to seize the, you know, those documents? In, in the streets, in a car? It has to be somewhere, arguably. And it happens that um, the, the seizure will occur in a house. But why should a house be, you know, free from the possibility of uh, entry by, by, you know, by the agency if the, if, the, if the act itself authorizes the agents to seize documents? That so the well, the act presents what may be a prima facie case to support its actions by the agency. Yes. So the act, uh, it would appear, uh, does authorize the actions of the agency because the act clearly says that the agency can seize documents. So I, I make this point again to emphasize that when we have the final assessment questions you need to be able to identify the proper legal question. Because if you don't, and let's say you end up identifying the wrong legal issue, you'll end up with a conclusion, for example, that no, uh, I would advise LAM not to question the validity of the actions of the agency because the decision is authorized by the statute. And Jerry? Uh, I'll go back to you, Louise. Let me just finish this. I'll, I'll get back to you. So if you say, therefore, that if your advice is, you know, that the decision is authorized by the statute, that would actually be wrong because there is a ground that would indicate that the actions of the agency are invalid, which we will get to in a short while. Yes, Lois, go ahead, please. Just, just with your comment that we, we have to get the right um, legal issue in the exam. Yes. Do um, yes. you plan on doing something like you did for constitutional law um, where you gave us like options of which, which way to go with that? Um, Someone did write it in the um, text box a bit earlier um, where you, you listed, I don't know, three or four possible legal issues and we had to run with which one we felt and answer the question in accordance with which legal issue we felt it was because we were all having issues with we identifying did. the correct legal issue in that subject. I just we wondered... If, yeah, we did that in constitutional law. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm just wondering if people are having the same issue in this subject of uh, identifying the correct legal issue. Would you, do you suppose it's a good thing to be doing that? Like, would, would it not make the exam too easy for you guys? Well, I, I personally, I, I found it better for constitutional law. I, I mean, I can only speak for myself, um, yeah. but I found it better, um, especially being a take home paper. Okay. Um, but I mean, um, you, you'd have to ask everybody else, I guess. But um, if I felt it worked really well for constitutional law, but okay. So, um, what do people think? Um, would it help if um, Amanda Smith said I found it more confusing when I uh, provided the uh, legal issues? Good. I found it very helpful, Manjo. So I support Lois's comment and Marcus's comment in the chat. Ah, okay. From Courtney, I, I would find it confusing. So what exactly do I do? <laughs> do I provide the legal issues, you know, multiple choice or not? Or do I leave it to the students to identify the legal issue? Can you um, no, don't. Put, a, put a poll on the, um, on the Moodle page and see what like, the, the majority of students think? 
But how is that? How is that helping us identify, learning to identify the legal issues? It's it's part of the process of, of 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 being able to crawl before you walk and and then therefore run. You can't just be looking for a, a crutch or a stick all the time. I appreciate the assistance that might be provided, but you really need to be. I mean, you, you, you want to come out of this with a with a level of competence that is recognised by your professional peers. You won't do that mm. by then saying, well, where's my, where's, where, where, where are my options that I've got to choose from? That you, No, I don't think it's right. Okay. So let, let's leave that argument for now. I mean, that discussion for now. We, we can revisit that. So that's the difficulty I have sometimes, you know. Um, people have opposing views. And both sides are valid but so we will have to revisit that for some other time i will take the um all the comments on board let me think about it and if a poll is needed we'll put up a poll although you know if the class is split i don't really know what to do but for now let's leave it at, at that and, yes can i just say working through the issues like you're doing right now and pulling everything apart is helping a lot so okay Doing this sort of stuff is really good. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, because we're kind of running out of time, I'm just going to, you know, self-direct this for now. So to me, the, uh, the decision whether or not it's authorized with the statute is a red herring. It is not the legal issue, because even if you were to say, you know, if you felt that that was the legal issue, and then you say that the decision, in fact, authorizes the statute, you would then end up with the wrong legal advice, which is to say that LAMP shouldn't. Uh, question the validity of the actions of the agency because it seems to be authorized. Now, the, the aspect about the, whether or not the discretion is uh, exercised properly, it, it shouldn't have to uh, come into play because there is no question here about the exercise of discretion. So I would think that the proper legal issue really here is whether or not the actions of the agency constitute a breach of the right of natural justice, right to natural justice of land. That is the legal issue. So. Having identified the legal issue, what we then need to do following the IRAC format is to identify the, legal, the relevant legal rules. And we will recall, following, following Kiowa versus Rest, for example, or Cooper versus uh, Board of Works for the Wandsworth District, that when, uh, when the actions of the executive uh, have an effect, the rights, the interests, or legitimate expectations of an individual, then that individual should be accorded the right to natural justice. So let me repeat, following the case of, so what we did was after we identified the legal issue, we then identified the rule, right? Following the IRAC format. So following the IRAC format, because we've narrowed down the issue to the question of natural justice, the next thing we should do is to identify the relevant real rule in relation to the right to natural justice. And we will recall in the case of PO versus West, as well as Cooper uh, versus Board of Works for the Wandsworth District, that the rule is that, be, that the, if the actions of an executive affect the rights, interests, or legitimate expectations of an individual, that individual has the right to natural justice, which includes the right to be heard before his rights, his, before his, rights, his interests, or legitimate expectations are affected by the actions of the executive. So that is the rule. Now, in the case of Cooper versus Board uh, of Works for the Wandsworth District, the, the court was very clear that in relation to property, uh, and we have here the, you know, the citation from Mira, no man should be deprived of his property without having his, without his having an opportunity to be heard. And that seems to be applicable, very applicable to the current factual scenario. Now, um, so following this, therefore, we've discussed the issue, we've discussed the rules, so applying it to the facts, we, we, we clearly see that um, the actions of the agency affected the, you know, affected the, the, the right to property of Lamb, and Lamb was not given the opportunity to be heard, which therefore meant that his right to natural justice was violated or was breached by the actions of the agency. Now, there was an argument earlier that was made that because Lamb's agent, uh, business was unregistered, it therefore meant that um, you know, he, he did not deserve prior notice. But that is not the case. The fact remains that uh, Lamb has, uh, th those are properties that belong to Lamb. And the rule in Cooper versus uh, 
board of works for the Wentworth district is that if the the rights, especially through property of a person, are affected by the actions of an agency, that person should first be given an opportunity to be heard. And the reason cited by the court was it is possible that the individual could have a very innocent or strong explanation why he failed to register his business in the first place. It could have been that he might actually have submitted his uh, documents and they could have gotten lost. There could have been a var variety of reasons, but the what, what, what the court was emphasizing in the case of Cooper was that these individuals whose rights to property were affected by executive action needed first to be heard before they were deprived of their property. Okay. Now, are we clear about that? Sorry, yeah, I'll just, I'll just mm -hmm. because in Keogh versus West, it was about personal liberty, not property. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's right. So Keogh versus West, yeah. More highly than personal liberty in some regards, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, um, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult argument to say that uh, personal liberty is necessarily more valued by Kiowa versus West, because um, what, what is important to recognize is that there are, you know, various rights that a person might have. And in fact, if you follow, if you look at the American Constitution, it is about the right to life, liberty or property. So they seem to be uh, equally important. And uh, the, certainly the case of Cooper versus Board works. Uh, does not make a distinction whether or not, and there is no reason why there has to be a distinction as to you know which is more important, whether it's right, life or liberty or property. They are uh, equally recognized as rights that need to be protected. But prior notice wasn't required in KL versus West because he was breaking the law because he was an illegal immigrant, and so they were detaining him um for that purpose whereas in this case with cooper it was about personal property and they say that it is required yeah. notice. actually in the case of keogh versus west the ruling of the high court was that the uh continuing detention of uh, keogh was unlawful so the finding my mistake, my mistake. there was a fail there was a breach of the right to natural justice in the case of keogh by the minister for immigration Okay, now, let me just backtrack a bit, okay? Now, if this were a final assessment question, before we even go to that aspect about the legal issue, which is about the, the potential breach of the right to natural justice, because we talked about judicial review, the first basic question we ask is whether or not judicial review is actually available under the ADJR Act. That is the first question that needs actually uh, to be discussed. So. There would have been two legal issues here. The first legal issue is, is this, um, would a potential breach of uh, the right to natural justice uh, actually involve uh, a recourse under the ADJR Act? That would have been the first question, okay? And the answer would have been that because the decision was made under an enactment, in this case, that's the Business Regulations and Control Act Commonwealth, there, then under the ADGR Act, because the decision is made under an enactment, an application for judicial review under that act is available. So having said that, we, we, will, we will probably quickly dispense with the, with the issue of legal standing. Obviously, Lamb has legal standing because it is his uh, property which has been affected. Uh, in, a, in a final assessment question, we will have to identify the ground for judicial review. And the ground, obviously, is the right to natural justice. So we've talked about uh, whether or not a, the ADGR Act is available on the basis of um, the decision being made under, so whether or not it's an administrative decision, and secondly, if it is an administrative decision, whether it's an administrative decision made under an enactment, for the purpose of determining whether or not recourse is available under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977 Common. Second point was the legal standing. The legal standing is obvious because Lamb's properties were seized, the third question is the question of the ground for judicial view. The ground is the breach of natural justice. We would be uh, talking as well in a final assessment question, the remedy. And the remedy is something we discuss further later on, but what this will probably involve is a quashal of the order to, uh, to seize the property, which means to invalidate the court making a declaration to invalidate the order seizing the properties, including uh, an order to return uh, through, an, through a man mandatory uh, injunction for the agency to return the properties back to, um, to land. 
But that's a topic we're discussing, I think, in week 11. Fifthly, if you wanted to, it's going to be very quick. You're going to be asking whether or not this is a justiciable question. And it certainly is. And j just as a quick review, the question about justiciability is whether or not it is a, what is involved is a legal question and that it is not a political question that is best reserved to um, the elected members of the government. This is a legal question because it involves a potential violation of a, of a, of a legal right. And that is a question that obviously belongs exclusively to the courts. Okay, so if I were the solicitor, I would advise LAB to question the, to question the validity of the actions of the agency because uh, the agency violated the rights to natural justice of land. And I would cite, you know, what I have said earlier. Okay, so we're good with that? We'll just quickly move on because we're kind of running out of time. Okay, question two. Can I, uh, problem two, can I get somebody to read problem two for us? Yeah, I'll do it. Thank you, Carl. So, during a TV interview with with James Colt for the televised Colt Report. Minister for Immig Immigration and Border Protection, the Minister, Scott Tomlinson, said, as the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection, I have very strong reservations about people applying for Australian resident visas who claim to have an epiphany and claim to be good and honourable people, good and honourable men, despite having committed serious crimes and atrocities in the past as jihadi fighters abroad. These people are heavily radicalised by their war experiences and pose a potential danger to our community. Even if they may appear respectable today by running a string of businesses in Sydney or elsewhere. About a month after the TV interview, Omar Awaldi, who owns a profitable chain of laundromats in Sydney, received a letter from a delegate of the minister informing him that his application for an Australian permanent visa had been denied on account of evidence that he had committed serious crimes and atrocities in the past as a jihadi fighter abroad. The letter stated further that notwithstanding the character references and evidence presented by Awaldi, that he was a changed man. The minister was of the view that Awali is an excluded person under the Migration Act 1958 Commonwealth. Awali has come to you for advice as a solicitor and believes that the minister was biased against him. Advi advise Awali, advice, advise Awali in the minister's decision may be affected by an actual bias as shown by his TV statements and whether there may have been a breach of natural justice. Thank you, Carl. So um, you will notice that what I've actually done for this question is that I've actually narrowed down the legal issue, correct? I've, I've already asked the question whether or not it has, you know, the minister's decision may have been affected by an actual bias as shown by his TV statements and whether they have, there may have been a breach of natural justice. So if I did that, that is the legal issue already that you need to, that you need to discuss. Okay. Can I have somebody volunteer to answer that question? Okay, so for Mira, it's um, the second issue this time about natural bias is a question of uh, but natural justice is a question about bias. Okay. Thank you, Mira. What do you think? Uh, comments? Now, before you continue, um, let me just make an observation here, uh, because Mira says that the facts imply there is an exclusion clause under the Immigration Act, okay, that excludes certain persons, people from qualifying for a permanent visa. Okay. Um, very good, Mira. Let, let me just make a reminder that when, when I have a question in a final assessment, you shouldn't be reading, don't go to the original enactment. Don't read it. Stick to the facts that are there. Are we clear about that? So do not go into an actual act. And I've, I think I've done that with the quizzes. Don't complicate things because the, the, you should be able to answer on the basis of the facts that are there. And certainly, 
don't attempt to, let's say, read the Public Service Act or whatever. Focus on what is there. So the only relevant acts you will obviously need to examine, for example, will be the ADJR Act, the Constitution uh, in the original, or perhaps the Administrative Appeals Tribunal Act of um, 1975, or maybe the, um, the Judiciary Act of 1903, particular Section 39B. But otherwise, any references to any statute that would be in the factual scenario, don't go reading the, the original enactment of the original statute. Okay, so any, any uh, attempt to answer uh, question problem two? Manjo, I believe that it is a breach of natural justice. The Go fact ahead. that he hasn't been given the exact reasons as to why he has been excluded. Ah. Uh, why the, um, you know, why the weightings on his um, letters and reference, character references, mm. have been outweighed by the, the things against him. Mm. I see. Good point. Can I say something? Yes, Mira. I thought um, that, you know, that, that bias is established if a reasonable layperson observed might possibly apprehend that the decision had been prejudged. Mm -hmm. That's the definition of bias. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's the issue of ministers, as was in your notes, that ministers um, are not. Um, expected to be as impartial as judges and finders of fact because they are inherently partial to the interests of their party who um, expose certain um, policies that are against another party in the uh, parliament. Very so, good. Is that relevant here? Very um, relevant. I hope that you pick, I mean, the class picked up what Mira has just said. That is six extremely two. relevant. That is correct. And I, I will follow that is very correct, Mira. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Other comments? Yeah, Manya. So oh. what we're saying is that um, so there's intermediate um, there's intermediate um, decisions that are made here leading up to the ultimate decision, right? So the intermediate intermediate decisions are part of the the, the process. They're um, and this is what uh, they've been gathering evidence against him. Now, this evidence is, 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 is and, and the decisions that they're making along the line of the evidence is the conduct. You, you've got to bear with me. I've been reading um, on, um, on Bond and the ABT, the ABT and Bond tonight. Yeah, so prior to this. So, but the, the, it is one of these things is that it bears out is there's, the two stages to what they're doing here, there is the intermediate um, processes that then re then then become the substantive um, decision yeah. that they make, right? So separating the two out, they still need they can't they can't make it they can't make that decision upon. Well, it, it just doesn't know. Well, yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm having difficulty explaining it, but no, there, there is not the natural justice. There's not um, the, 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 the rule of law going on here when mm. this decision from these um, preliminary um, fact-finding mm. um, decisions are not really stacking up in the other, and they, when they don't, Come, the, he's not tied in there in any way with any of these preliminary decisions. He's he's not involved. In, there's no questioning. There's no nothing. It's just like we've done all this. Mm. Here you go. We, this is the result. So I mean, obviously, he's been left out of the loop. He's he's not been um, given any case to answer. He's not been involved in any of the investigations that any the, that have led into this. Mm. So he's been. He, he's outside of the conduct with regard to the, um, the, the the process, you know. So, therefore, to then come up with this decision that this is what's going to happen, that you, you no, it, it, you can't do it. Sorry. Okay. I don't agree, Carl, because 
Has he had option to give his character reference? So he has been involved. Mm. Yeah, but I mean, give your character reference. Who's that from? What? What's that? I mean, this is like, I mean, what, and, and then have what? And that, that is, you're talking about a written character reference, or you're talking about a, a, a character reference which is over the phone, or have you ever read a bad character reference? I mean, character reference is really. Yeah, no. I mean, you weigh it up, and the character reference itself is is, yeah, all right, great. Okay. Who, who do you want that from? But who are you going to hold in regard to giving the character reference substance? Thank you. What uh, we're talking about the here is the reference would have gone in with the original application, though. Yeah. Okay. Can I? Can I? Do you mind if I step in because yeah. of the time, and some of you may be missing dinner if we extend too much. So the issue about character references, which was also alluded to by Carl, was actually the first point raised by, by PETA when she said that there was a probability that there was a violation of the, of the right to natural justice because Ovaldi was not given the right to be heard. Okay, now let me begin by pointing out that actually, if you look at the instructions, the question should have been about actual bias, not about the prior hearing rule. Okay, so... If you look at the right to natural justice, it has two components. The first is that an affected individual uh, should first be heard before his rights, interests, or legitimate expectations are affected by the actions of the executive. So that's the first, that's the right to the, the prior hearing. There's the second component to the right to natural justice, and that is that the decision maker must be free from bias, okay? So that point about the prior hearing rule should not be a legal issue here, mainly because the instructions are clear. We're talking about actual bias. And even if that had been the legal issue, it is unlikely to be the case that there was a violation of the right to natural justice. Because it would appear from the facts that he was able to submit character references. He was in fact heard. Evidence was presented, except that the evidence was not persuasive enough uh, for, for the minister to grant a visa to Owaldi. So to me, that shouldn't be the, the legal issue there. Now, let me address first the second aspect coming from Carl before I talk about the actual legal issue here. So Carl talked correctly about uh, the intermediate rule as opposed to the, the final rule. And we will recall in the case of Bond versus Australian Broadcasting Tribunal that before uh, judicial review is available, what should be involved is a final operative and substantive decision, not an intermediate decision, okay? And the reason for that is if, that, if the courts were to be permitted to uh, examine in, a, in an application for judicial review every single intermediate decision, there would be no end because an intermediate decision could be as simple as somebody not per being permitted to submit evidence, somebody not being granted uh, you know, an adjournment, and so on. So the court was clear in the case of Bond versus Australian Broadcasting Tribunal, the judicial review is available only when there is a final operative and substantive decision. Now, going to the facts, therefore, it should be apparent that what is involved is a final operative and substantive decision because it is a decision which denied the visa application of, of Scott, Tom, uh, of, of um, Owaldi. So again, that is not the legal issue. The legal really issue really here is whether or not there was a breach of natural justice in the sense that there was an actual bias that was shown by the minister uh, in the form of the interview, the TV interview that he granted where he questioned the uh, innocence and you know the change of character of jihadi fighters. That is the legal question there. Uh, did the minister evince or demonstrate a bias that should have disqualified him from making a decision so that in making a decision, he then violated the right to natural justice of Owaldi? That is the legal issue. Okay, now the rule, uh, I think Mira may have, uh, alluded to this as well, in the case of Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs versus GIA, is that, especially in the case of ministers, ministers are a different set of political, a different set of animals in the sense that they're political. They are actually permitted to uh, be able to make statements about government policy. And the fact alone that they make statements about government policy does not mean that they should be disqualified from then making a 
an executive decision. That is one. Now, what would in fact disqualify uh, a, a minister or an executive decision maker from making a decision on the ground of actual bias is not so much because that that person seems to have made a prejudgment about a case through his opinions, but it is whether or not the prejudgment he has in his mind is incapable of alteration, regardless of whether or not there is countervailing evidence. Because the courts were clear in the case of Minister for Immigration and Multicultural Affairs versus GIA, that everybody always has a prejudgment, right? I mean, no one comes into a case without certain prejudices, without certain ideas about how a case should be resolved. They're, we're human beings in the same way that, you know, uh, ministers can do that. But what would disqualify an executive is not the existence of a prejudgment, but that prejudgment being so permanent that it is incapable of alteration regardless of any evidence or arguments that are presented before him. So the court ruled that the mere fact that there is a, a, a statement or actions made by a minister that would tend to show, uh, you know, an action that seems to, 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 that would tend to show a bias against a potential applicant is not a disqualifying factor and does not mean that there is an actual bias simply because there's a prejudgment. The, 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 the bigger question is whether or not it is incapable of alteration. So having now stated the rules, so we talked about the issue, we discussed the rule, apl applying it to the facts, there is nothing that would indicate that the minister, uh, you know, it's difficult to show that the minister's mind is incapable of um, being altered by the evidence. To show that, the, 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 the lawyer will have to show that all the decisions of the minister tended to turn down applications by jihadi fighters. And I think that will be, a, you know, that, that will be difficult to prove. Okay, so on this basis, therefore, um, the, the advice that should be given is that the minister's uh, statements on TV merely show a possible prejudgment but it doesn't mean that the, that the minister has foreclosed his mind to the idea that somebody such as Owaldi has actually had a change of heart and should be qualified for a, a visa. If uh, you know, Owaldi's uh, visa application was turned down, it wasn't because of a actual bias by the minister. It was simply based on the evidence before the minister. So therefore, I would advise as a lawyer against uh, an application for judicial review on the ground of an actual bias uh, being demonstrated by the minister. So we, so we, 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 we're saying that as well. He is a um, a former jihadi fighter. Yes. So I mean, this is this is similar to um, what happened. Uh, I was going to say earlier this year, but last year with um, when the, the the Trump administration um, tried to enforce their the travel ban. Mm. And there was a um, the legal actions that were brought against that was mm. that prior to the, the the Trump people actually becoming the administration, they had voiced as part of their um, electioneering and part of their policy policy um, that they were going to keep Muslims out, and but which was obviously going to be um, illegal in the states. But then when they enforced the travel ban. They used the evidence of what they were saying during the electioneering mm. as part of the as part of the um, evidence against it. But I mean, but I, I I just don't get it. How is anyway? I don't know. I'm sorry. Sure. Um, I'm just gonna, sorry. Sorry. I'm just going to dispense that quickly because um, I noticed it's almost eight o'clock. We will of course extend to finish questions three and four for those who need to go. You know, you're free to go. Let me just make a quick statement about what Carl said, because it is a valid point. We have to make a distinction between what happened in the U.S. and, you know, th this particular case. The, the, what happened in the U.S. were actually constitutional law questions. Okay. It was a constitutional law question because what had arisen was, the co was whether or not the, the executive orders by Donald Trump were actually constitutional. Okay. It, it would become an administrative law question when by applying the, the, the uh, executive order of Trump, it then affects an individual. 
So let's make a distinction there. As far as administrative law is concerned, it shouldn't be concerned with whether or not the law, the statute itself is constitutional or not. That is a constitutional law question. As far as um, judicial review is concerned, it would essentially involve a question of, it, there would simply be essentially an assumption that the law is, is legal. Now, if the, the constitutionality of the law itself is being questioned, that is not a, a constitutional, that is no longer an administrative law question, it becomes a, a an, an, it, it, that is no longer an administrative law question, it becomes a constitutional question that is applicable to all. Now, I'm just going to have to quickly leave that because I'd like to move on to questions three and four, if you don't mind, because we might get too sidetracked. Okay, moving on. Should I just, can I just get somebody to read question, problem three, then I will answer it myself, if that is all right? Because we're kind of running out of time. I'll read it, Manjo. Thank sure. you, Amanda. Yes? Um, Clemshaw Star Proprietary Limited is an online retailer of imported electronic gadgets and toys operating since 2014 under an annual renewal business license issued by the Australian Business Regulatory Agency, ABRA. In December 2017, it received a notice from the ABRA that its application for renewal of business license had been rejected on the ground that some of its imported products had been the subject of complaints from consumers for being faulty. The Business Regulations and Control Act Commonwealth requires that before a person or persons may engage in business or a commercial activity, it must first secure a business license from the ABRA, which has the discretion to grant the license as it sees fit. The Act provides that the agency has the power to shut down a business or commercial activity that operates without a license. In addition to in addition, the agency may also seize documents, papers, goods, properties and assets belonging to an unregistered business and impose a fine. Clemshaw Star Proprietary Limited uh, come to you as a solicitor for advice. Advise it on the validity or invalidity of the actions of the agency. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Let, let me just point out a few things here, okay? The question is, uh, Okay, so the legal, let me identify the legal issue first of all. So the legal issue is whether or not the, there is a breach of uh, natural justice, uh, the right to natural justice uh, in the case of Clamshaw Store Proprietor Limited. So that is the legal question. That is the legal issue. The question though is, has the right, is there any right of Clamshaw that has been violated? Is there any interest of Clamshaw that has been violated? Is there any legitimate expectation of Clamshaw that has been that has been uh, breached. Let's begin with the first one. Is there a right? Does Clemshaw have a right to be granted a license? Yes or no? No. Yeah, well, it, it's um. Well, I mean, they they they've told that they can't um, import things upon complaints. So I mean, basically, there's there's no um, there's no, there's no justice with regard to mm. what 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 is the complaint? What is the basis of the complaint? Um, who's hurt? Who's done what? Have done whatever? So mm. on 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 the end of there being a bit of bad press or um, commentary or a couple of letters of complaint, um, they now can't maintain their business as they were doing which is not right there's there's no answer to it there's no nothing they that that is an injustice okay natural justice thank you carl now let, so let me just clarify first the issue about a right there is no such thing as a right to a license it is a license so it depends on on the uh, issuing authority and you know the issuing authority uh, has the discretion, it probably has to comply with certain criteria before it issues a license. And so therefore, a person or a business can't just say, I have a right to a license, even assuming that, you know, um, Clemshaw did not have any faulty products. Even if its products were, were perfect, they were flawless, there is no right to a license. Are we clear about that? Now, it is different if Clemshaw had been given a license and then that license was revoked. Then in that case, 
the right to natural justice would have been clear, but that is not the case here. We're dealing here with an application for a business license that was rejected. So there is no right to an app, there is no breach of the right to natural justice because there is no right that has been violated because Clemsho does not have a right to a license. Now, does it have an interest? Again, there is not because you know rights and interests are quite related. Um, it cannot argue that it has an interest in having a, um, a license. The question is, is there a legitimate expectation that it should have a license, it should have been issued a license? So I will answer that question because we're kind of running out of time. If you, can, if you follow the case of FAI Insurance um, Limited versus Winiki, um, the High Court has said that um, following Kiowa versus West, that um, when the actions of the executive affect the right, interest, or legitimate expectations of a person, then that person must be accorded uh, procedural fairness or natural justice. Now, what is legitimate expectation? Legitimate expectation hasn't really been defined. What the courts have done instead are to provide examples of what instances uh, may, may constitute uh, a person having a legitimate expectation. In the case of FAI uh, Insurances Limited versus Winiki, the High Court uh, clarified that when, a, that when a business has been operating for, us for some time, and then it has constantly been getting a, a business license, it is therefore natural for it to expect there is a legitimate expectation on the part of that business to be granted a, a license. And if its application for a license were to be denied, it should first be given an opportunity to be heard. Are we clear? So having said that, the legal issue was whether or not there was a breach of uh, the right of Clemsho to, to natural justice. And I explained the rule that following FAI Insurance Limited versus Winiki, the High Court has said that um, the, when, when a business has been operating uh, with a license, it has a legitimate expectation that before uh, its application for renewal of a license would be denied, it will be given an opportunity to be heard. In this case, the, uh, the ABRA did not give um, Clemshaw an opportunity to be heard before it denied uh, its application for a renewal of license. Now, I have a question. We'll change the facts a bit. Had uh, Clemshaw applied for a license for the first time, first time application, okay? Changing, I'm changing the facts a bit. I'm just clarifying a point here. If Clemshaw had applied for a business license for the, for the first time, not a renewal, application for a first time, would Clemshaw have a legitimate expectation that before its application for a license would have been granted, it should have been given an opportunity to be heard? The answer is no. Okay, so the, the answer is no. So it is only in relation to um, an application for a renewal of license following FAI Insurance Limited versus Winiki that the High Court has said that when a business has been operating for some time with a valid license, it has certainly a legitimate expectation that it will be afforded uh, an opportunity to be heard before its application is denied. Clear? Um, now, so it's about renewal. Now, Let's just clarify this point about legitimate expectation further, if you don't mind. If some of you have to go, you, please feel free to go. Um, but I'm just going to clarify a few more points here. What does it mean when you say that legitimate, there is a legitimate expectation? So let's assume that a decision maker uh, would, would probably, because one other way that le a legitimate expectation can be engendered is when a decision maker makes a statement to the effect that, you know, your, uh, your application is likely to be granted. Okay, are we clear? That, that is a way that there is a legitimate expectation. So if there is an executive decision maker making a statement that my application, for example, is likely to be granted, then it engenders in me a legitimate expectation that if my application were to be denied, I should first be heard. Are we clear about that? That is an example of an instance when there is a legitimate expectation. Are we clear? Clear so far? Now my question is, if therefore a decision maker has made a statement to an applicant saying that his application 
is likely to be granted. Okay? And then the decision maker changes his mind and denies the application, but provided that person the opportunity to be heard before the denial was made. Is there a breach of the right to natural justice? Do you want me to repeat the question? Or was the question clear? Was the question clear or not? No, the question wasn't clear. Let me repeat. So let's assume that somebody applied for a license, or it could be anything, okay, before an executive decision maker. The executive decision maker made a statement that he is likely to approve the application. Clear so far? Now, because of that statement, that will engender a legitimate expectation on the part of the applicant that before his application is denied, he will be given an opportunity to be heard. That's the law. That's clear. Now, the question I have is, what if the decision maker, in fact, denies the application, but before denying the application, the decision maker gave the applicant the opportunity to be heard? Clear? Question I have is, is there a breach of the right to natural justice? Well, as long as um, the, 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 the relevant uh, issues and queries were, 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 were communicated properly from both parties, so there being no further issue, yeah, one would assume that, that, that natural justice was conducted properly or mm. provided. Very good. So that's the correct answer, uh, Carl. So here, uh, there would have been no breach of natural justice because on the basis of the legitimate expectation, the person was in fact given an opportunity to be heard prior to the denial. The mere fact alone that a decision maker may have expressed a preliminary decision of sorts to, to act in a particular way does not foreclose or prevent that decision maker from arriving at a final decision that is different from that preliminarily given. Are we clear? So he can still change his mind. For as long as um, the person who had a legitimate expe expectation to be heard had in fact been given an opportunity to be heard. Okay, final question here, relating, kind of closely related to the quiz. Okay, um, can I ask a volunteer? And then I'll just provide the answer here so we'll, we'll be done quickly with it. Can I get a volunteer to read question, the prob problem for, for us? So Dr. James Smith, a registrar, medical practitioner, at Royal Queensland Hospital, a hospital created under the Royal Queensland Hospital Act Commonwealth, applied for promotion, <coughs> sorry, to senior, senior registrar. James had been a registrar at the hospital for over five years and had a sterling record in terms of his medical practice and research publications. During his annual performance review in June 2017, <clears throat> the hospital medical director, Dr. Tom Block, advised James to apply for a promotion to senior register because he was overdue for a promotion under the Act since he had been a registrar for over five years and had a sterling record in terms of his medical practice and research publications. James subsequently filed his application for promotion together with voluminous records and documents establishing his qualifications for promotion to senior registrar. James was interviewed by the Hospital Promotions Committee during which Dr Block, who chaired the hospital's promotions committee, strongly endorsed James's application. Dr. Block later told James that he was very confident that the committee would likely approve the application for promotion given his endorsement of James's application. It was thus with great disappointment that James was informed in December 2017 that his application for promotion had been rejected. He was irked because he had not been informed why his application was rejected, given his strong credentials. He strongly feels that under the circumstances, he had a legitimate expectation to be promoted, hence his right to natural justice was, in his view, breached. 
James has come to you as a solicitor for advice. Advise James about his legal rights, if any, and the possible legal remedies. Okay. Should be able to see a connection between this and um, the quiz. So um, there is no right to be promoted, right? <laughs> we should be clear about that. No yeah. one is allowed to be promoted. <clears throat> Was there a legitimate expectation to be promoted? Um, I don't see how that can be the case. So there is no interest, obviously. So the answer here is that what James actually ha had is probably a mere hope. He had a hope, which is not the same as a legitimate expectation. And so following the case of South Australia versus O'Shea and Housher versus Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs, a mere hope by itself is not sufficient ground, it's not sufficient to ground an expectation that there will then be uh, legal consequences. So a mere hope is not a legitimate expectation. So the mere fact that a hope uh, has not eventuated does not mean that there is a breach of natural justice. We can all have hopes, but hope is not the same as a right, an interest, or a legitimate expectation. So if I were the solicitor of James, I would advise him that he should not apply for judicial review because it is unlikely to be uh, successful because his right to natural justice has not been breached. He does not have a right, an interest, or a legitimate expectation to be promoted. All he had is a mere hope, which following the case of South Australia versus O'Shea and Housher versus the Ministry of Immigration and Ethnic Affairs, uh, both uh, indicate that hope does not attract legal consequences. Okay. So that's it's a similar, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, it's, a, it's a similar circumstance to Queen, isn't it? Sorry, what was that? It's a similar circumstance to Queen. To the what? Where, um, where with oh. the, the the yes. magistrate is no longer required as a magistrate. Queen versus New South Wales. Uh, I'm not sure if the facts are necessarily the same. Um, it was about a new uh, piece of legislation that was passed. Yeah. Dispense with uh, yeah. create a new policy so that the um, the AG could just get say that, no, there's a new policy that you have to meet. This doesn't yeah. include a new legislation. Yeah, the factual circumstances are, are, are really quite different. Not, not, this is not the same. Uh, from Kathleen, sorry, not legally, but still should have been given reasons. Okay, very good. Let's ask that question. Is the, as, as part of uh, the right to natural justice, is there a, a, a right on the part of an applicant for a job, for promotion, to be provided reasons why his application had been denied, such that the failure of the decision maker to provide reasons is a violation of the right to natural justice. So is there a violation of the right to natural justice if the decision maker does not provide reasons for the decision? That's the question. The answer is no. There is no common law right to be given reasons for a decision. There is no common law right. Potentially, there could be a right if it is provided in a statute. But if you follow common law, there is no common law right to be given reasons for a decision. However, we will recall that under the Administrative Appeals Tribunal Act of 1975 Commonwealth, Assuming that, you know, there is an administrative decision, the administrative decision is based on an enactment, and that enactment provides that there is recourse to the AAT uh, on the basis of, an, uh, of a merits review. Under the AAT Act of 1975, the moment that there is an application for uh, merits review, under the law, the decision maker is obliged to provide reasons for the decision. So there is no legal requirement under the AAT Act. But before that, especially in the context of not under the AAT Act, but judicial review, there is no common law right to be given reasons for a decision. And the failure to give reasons, therefore, will not constitute a breach of the right to natural justice. Yes, who was it? Who said? Oh, excuse me, Manjo. 
Yes. What yes. if Dr. Tom Block has shown bias against James? Will that have changed the answer? A bias in favor of James, you mean? I, oh, yeah. Has yes. shown a bias towards James during um, well, during the interview that he has actually demonstrated a bias. Well, if Dr. Block was biased in favor of James, James most likely will not be complaining. <laughs> because it's favorable to him. But I meant if he has been biased, would that have uh, awarded him natural justice? Uh, you mean if there was a bias against James, you mean? Because yes. The facts say it's for James. This no, bias against James, against James from Dr. Tom Block or one of the board. Uh, I mean, we, we don't have it in the facts, okay? So that's difficult to say. But assuming it were in the facts that, you know, one of the decision makers was biased, then yes, uh, there is a possibility that there would be a breach of natural justice, not so much about actual bias, but because of an apprehended bias. So uh, under the concept of apprehend, apprehended bias, to an ordinary bystander, not only is there a requirement that justice is done, but to the ordinary bystander, the, the bystander must perceive that justice is likely to be done. So when there is an instance of an apprehended bias in the sense that the ordinary bystander is likely to conclude that the decision maker is, is biased, then uh, that will be a ground, there will be a breach of natural justice if that decision maker does not recuse himself or disqualify himself. But that is not what is in the facts. But that is a valid question, uh, Yomi. Okay, it's um, 8.17. Any questions before we end tonight's session? Comments? So just actual bias versus apprehended bias. Yes. Because um, the question about bias said it was actual bias. Uh, sorry, um, you're, you're cutting out. I was out. just confused you're about right. the difference in the meaning. Sorry, you're cutting out. I was confused about the difference in the meaning. Ah, okay, okay. So let, let's give an example. Um, an actual bias is when there is a bias that is shown. So that could be hostility. So, you know, if you're appearing before a judge or a decision maker and that judge or decision maker is hostile against you, says statements bad against you, seems to have uh, really prejudged your case, uh, even before evidence has actually been presented, we can actually say that there is actual bias, as shown by, as demonstrated by the actions. So are we clear on that so far? Now, what is apprehended bias? Apprehended bias means that there is no indication or demonstration of actual actions or statements of an actual bias because the decision maker hasn't really done anything. But there is a possibility of an apprehended bias. For example, one, if the decision maker, say, has, um, has an interest in, um, in the results of the, of the decision, such as, if um, a decision maker were for, uh, if the decision maker, for example, were a shareholder uh, of a company that was appearing before him, that would account, that would be an example of an apprehended bias. You could apprehend a bias because imagine the decision maker owning shares of stock of a party appearing before the decision maker. That's an apprehended bias. Because there could also be apprehended bias in the form of uh, a disqualifying association. So in other words, if uh, when a decision is made, there is a person who happens to be the son or daughter of the decision maker, that is, again, you, can, you will have to apprehend a potential bias there, right? Uh, another example of an apprehended bias would be an instance when, um, in the case of Ib 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 Nessner versus uh, Knox City Council, um, there was a, a, a member of the, of the decision-making body uh, in relation to whether or not a dog should be put down because it had been vicious and injured somebody. And it was one of the decision makers, one of the members of the board of, um, or that board, deciding board, that had actually prosecuted in the magistrate's court um, the, the applicant uh, for violation of, of the law concerning vicious dogs. And after prosecuting um, that particular person, that, that prosecutor then became a, a, a member of a, of a panel that would then make a decision whether the dog should be put down. So the first one was, was in relation to the applicant's criminal liability for having a vicious dog, 
the second action which became the source of the case if necessary versus Knox City Council was whether or not the dog should be put down. But one of the members of that, um, in, of that panel that made the decision uh, that whether or not the dog should, should be put down was a prosecutor in the criminal action. And the court said that that is an example of an, of a, an apprehended bias. You could apprehend a bias on the part of the prosecutor because that, prosec that person was prosecuting um, the, the applicant. And it would be difficult to imagine that the prosecutor can just quickly change his, his or her mind that you know, the dog wasn't vicious when he or she was prosecuting the case criminally. Okay, questions? We're good. Um, Andrew, am I still doing my presentation tonight? Oh yeah, um, yes, Kathleen, if you're happy to proceed, uh, you, you can do the presentation and um, people can listen in to Kathleen's presentation. Uh, otherwise, you're free to go because I'll be the one miking um, Kathleen's presentation. So, um, Kathleen, I leave the floor to. Uh, I, I will now um, hand over the floor to you for you to do the presentation. And those who wish to stay, please stay. Those who feel like they would like to go, please go. But it'll be interesting to um, to um, listen in to Kathleen's presentation because you know you're going to be picking up a lot of points on how it should be done. So I'm going to stop sharing, Kathleen. Would you like to do the sharing of the screen yourself? Yes, please. Go ahead. You know, I mean, you, you can see the function there, right? Where you can share the screen? Yeah. Yeah, I just had to wait till you Very good. stop sharing yours. Um, now, um, Kathleen, before you continue, let me remind you that we have a, a rule that this should only be a five-minute presentation. And part of the uh, marking rubrics indicate that the failure to comply to meet the uh, time limits will be counted against you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Please, uh, please. Um, how do I tell whether my screen is? Do I just take it for granted that it's sharing? Because um, I can't see it sharing. Okay. I'm cool. Really That's good. 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 Very good. I'm just checking. <laughs> okay. I just want to move this so I can see. Okay, so um, right. So the case I am um, presenting tonight is Keogh and West, um, which is a 1985 High Court decision, and my partner for this case is Leanne Jones. Um, so the facts of the case are that Mr Keogh, Keogh was a Tongan citizen and came to Australia in September 1981 on a three-month student visa. Um, after his visa exp expired, he did apply for an extension, um, however, this was not processed, but well after that extension, he was found to be working um, in Victoria and subsequently arrested as an illegal immigrant. Um, so then a decision was made by a delegate of the department to deport Mr Keogh, and one of, um, and according to internal records, one of the matters taken into consideration was that Mr Keogh had allegedly become involved with other um, Tongan illegal immigrants and, and involved and supportive of. So the decision on legal principle applied in this case is to what decisions should rules of natural justice apply. Now the appellant argued that the ADJR Act at section 51A um, imposed natural justice on every administrative decision that the Act applies to, but the High Court rejected this argument um, and ruled that the section was actually in support of the common law rules of natural justice and therefore was not attempting to impose natural justice on cases where it would not otherwise apply in common law. Um, another uh, legal principle was the prior hearing rule. Um, so the common law allows that when a decision is made that will impact on a person's rights, interests or legitimate expectations, that they will have a right of reply. Um, so whilst in this case it was not a legitimate expectation that Mr Keogh would be heard um, on the reason to um, deport him as an illegal immigrant, um, the reasons not the decisions not to grant him further temporary or permanent residency um, included a reason in which he should have had a right of reply, and that was the alleged involvement um, with other Tongan um, um, illegal immigrants. So another rule was how does statutory interpretation of the Enabling Act impact on the rules of natural justice? Um, so the High Court supported the theory that natural justice should apply to all decisions affecting rights, interests and legitimate expectations of a person unless expressly excluded by statute. Um, and in doing so, the High Court ruled that Section 18 of the Migration Act 
do not make the rules of natural justice inconsistent with the Act's purpose and therefore um, you know, did not exclude um, natural justice for Mr Keogh. So the importance of this um, case to administrative law um, was brought about an increase in natural justice rules being applied to administrative decisions, um, particularly in relation to where it impacted on rights um, and interests in legitimate expectations, and that the prior hearing rule was dependent on the ex uh, dependent on the extent to which the decision impacted those rights, interests, or legitimate expectations. Uh, further, that natural justice or procedural fairness is protected um, from legislative encroachment unless the legislation is appropriately justified to do so. So the dominant ideology post here on this has been to protect the integrity of the court by protecting the rights of individuals to natural justice. So therefore, by maintaining an individual's rights um, to natural justice, they're also maintaining the separation of powers um, by not imposing Sorry, I keep clicking accidentally. <laughs> By not imposing um, non-judicial powers upon um, the courts um, and thus not um, being in violation of Section 71 of the Australian Constitution. And there's another case there, League versus Commonwealth, which um, further explored this. Um, now, since the ruling of Keogh and West, the dominant view has been there's no clear intention um, of the implied common law rules of natural justice, um, sorry, that there is an implied intention that the laws of natural justice will be presumed in cases, um, unless uh, the Act is very clear in its expectation that those rules not apply. Um, the legislation's intention to allow public official to remove or alter an individual's basic rights, interests or legitimate expectation must be regulated by the rules of natural justice unless the statute so clearly negates these rules in a way so as to remove any doubt whatsoever that that was the intention of the statute. Um, and I've just got a reference list there and that's about it. Thank you. Well done. That's uh, within uh, you know the five minute uh, timeline that we have. Well done, Kathleen. That was a very uh, very good presentation you made. Uh, very organized, very thorough, and very correct. So at least we've got somebody. You know, we, we have a an exemplar now of uh, what a uh, presentation should be. So, so thank you for that. I'm not going to be announcing you know the mics you're getting because that's something that I'll have to post in Gradebook, and I don't want to be you know. Um, telling everyone what your marks are, but you did really well tonight. So um, with that, uh, I end tonight's session and I thank Kathleen for um, doing a, uh, a live presentation of, the, uh, of one of the cases that she was assigned or that she chose. So thank you very much, Kathleen, and thank you everyone for joining tonight's session and for staying on. And uh, I hope to see you next week. Can I ask one quick question? Yes, really yes, go ahead. Sorry. Just, um, just about the course. Um, you know how you said everyone's gonna, you're gonna release all the case notes so that we can study for our exam that everybody's done? Is that what's gonna happen? Sorry, when would uh, that happen? Did yeah. you say that? Can, can you just slow down a bit, Mira? I'm having a hard time. Uh, everybody's trying... assignment, everyone's gonna do case notes. And uh -huh. didn't you say that we're all gonna get access to them all so we yes. can help ourselves study for the exam? Yes. Yes. I mean, when that would be released? Oh, are they all gonna be released when the marks are released? Um, they will be released prior to the exam. It's probably when the marks are released. So what I'm going to do is to compile it, uh, compile all the cases in a PDF, and I will uh, make the PDF available to all the students so that they would then um, have access to all the case notes. And when I prepare the PDF, the case notes um, will be distributed according to the sections, uh, the topical sections that we have, or the top, the topics we have each week. Now, from Kyla, what if someone uses one that wasn't done right that has incorrect facts? Uh, I'm not going to be able to. Um, I'm not going to be able to make a comment about you know whether or not this is um, that. That's the problem there. Manjo, just quickly, um, I think I read in your email something about it being submitted in a PDF. Is that correct? Yes. So you want us to submit our case notes in PDFs? Oh, hang on. Did I say PDF or MS Word? Yeah. Uh, did I say PDF? Um, it's probably going to be in an MS Word. I forgot now because there. Turn it in. You said it's Word. 
Uh, I think it's probably MS Word because um, Turnitin only captures MS Word. It cannot read PDF. But yeah. after you submit it in MS Word, I will then give it back to you in the form of a PDF, you know, the, the compilation. But the submission itself, I think, is MS Word because that's the requirement of Turnitin. Okay. Do, we, do we have to provide our PowerPoints anywhere? Of tonight's presentation, uh, Kathleen? Yeah, like when everyone, whenever anyone does their presentation, do they need to provide you their PowerPoint? Um, um, the, good point. Uh, there's actually no need because um, all I'll be doing is actually to be, we'll be examining the video recording. In, in your case, because your video recording is part of the tutorial recording, you're free to submit your own, um, your own PowerPoint slides. Although I will be marking you on the basis of um, what you presented tonight. Okay. So thank you, everyone, and good night, and uh, Happy New Year. See you next week. Thanks. Bye. Bye.